And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a returning good brother to the temple. I'm a, the man behind Ash of Creativity, responsible for... M for a great multitude of of five E products that are not, that do that are probably not in the approved method of cre of creation according to Wizards of the Coast, but um, fuck them. And a, and a man who is now venturing into the wonderful world of co of comic books, the one and only the he the man who committed slander against me regarding my taste in Mecca a year ago. James mm. Streisand, how how the fuck you doing tonight? <laughs> doing uh, doing pretty good. Doing pretty good. How are you? I am do I'm doing good. It is my ideal kind of weather. N namely, too cold for everybody else. Mm. Sp apparently, sp apparently so before we both freeze to death, uh, cuz apparently apparently we're both due for that at mm. some point. Before the before the wonderful time of spring, I suppose we're gonna both freeze over. There is no such thing as people. spring around here. That's true. Like, well, I, they, I suppose that only adds to my point. Mm -hmm. Um, spring spring isn't real. It's spring is just a conspiracy to make summer look okay. Hmm. Um. There's the there's the old saying that if, that a forest only cares about summer and winter. And given how much forest there is around here, that's fairly accurate. But now I've now um I've for as long as I've known you, as long as you as long as you have poked and prodded at at me over the years, um I've mostly known you as a t as a tabletop guy. Um, mm. what prompted you to what, to venture into doing a fantasy comic? It was in roughly 2017, I believe. I started. I started writing up a comic script. I mm -hmm. think I've told the story elsewhere. But it's. It was pretty simple. I I wanted to start writing. I didn't know how to do dialogue, and I figured, well, I'll do a comic, and I'll have somebody else do the. You know, I'll write out the scenery. Mm -hmm. I'll write out the mood, and the scenario. I'll write out the context under which everything is going on, and. Then I'll just have somebody else write the dialogue. But what I found as I started writing through this, I get myself like a ten page, ten pages in ten day writing challenge because mm -hmm. I find writing to be excruciating. It's it's so painful for me to do. I hate it so much, and I can't wait to outsource most of the writing that I have to do because it's it's so bad. Um, I have to, I forcing myself to do writing is, is one of the most painful endeavors I could possibly do. But what I found was as I started getting towards the latter pages of that 10, you know, 10 pages and 10 days project is I started dipping into dialogue. I'm like, well, maybe, maybe I'll just try it out. You know, maybe I'll see what I can do. And I found that while I wasn't necessarily good at it at the time, uh, or even proficient in it. It started coming to me naturally, like the, the words started appearing on the page, as if, as if you know, you know, I was watching the scene play out between these two people, and I found basically that the parts of writing that I was confident I could do and set up allowed me to sort of evoke the dialogue out of me, which I could then go edit. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote. I ended up just writing a book out of it. I, the, the purpose of doing a comic fell by the wayside because look at this I can do dialogue but then I discovered one after I published it, I'm like well because you know eyes of the forest got as much attention as any any for person's first indie book is going to get which is to say none at all mm -hmm. uh, I I <laughs> yeah it wasn't gonna get any attention at all which I, which I knew ahead of time I, I wasn't expecting anything of the sort um I, I just I'm like well I could go back now and I could just take that original comic script and I could start I could start turning that into something and that's exactly what I did because mm -hmm. I saved all my materials from the from the first iteration of it. 
Yeah, and when it when it comes to when it comes to this particular comic, um, Eyes on the Fo- Eyes of the Forest, which you described on the in, on the Indiegogo page as a pulp fantasy comic about duty, betrayal, and telling people to get off your lawn. Um, what I want to focus on is the pulp part of that. Mm. Now, pulp tends to mean different things to different people, and I've had a couple people on who have talked about the whole pulp rev movement. But what is pulp to you, and what is the what is the um, draw? Uh, for me, it's a it is a linguistic constraint, or a or I guess a style constraint, where there is action, there is either fighting or dialogue on every page, mm-hmm. or action and dialogue on every page. There is there there is no page in which I do not either have somebody swinging a sword or shooting a gun, or or talking. There's always things are always moving forward, in some capacity, it is how I treat it, which is a bit like. I wouldn't say it's Matt Colville's de- definition, but it, it was kind of the uh, that's that's where mine was inspired from because he's when he describes his own book, he says there's action or dialogue on every page, and I said okay, that's that those are his pulp books, and mm-hmm. I think that's the model I'm going to follow, and and that's the model model I did follow. Yeah. Now, sometimes I've seen it where a where um, in particular with fantasy comics and um, and this. Is something I can, I can bring up, especially get, especially given, especially given that it's you, that it's you we're, de- we're I'm dealing with, where a uh, fantasy comic is sort of is sort of based on their, exper- their experiences with, um, a campaign. Was that the, was that the approach with this one, or was it a ki- or was it a different case? Oh, funnel, funnily enough, no. And I, I don't think I would make a, um, I don't think I would make a comic out of a, out of a campaign that I that I ran. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can't, I can't think of a circumstance under which I, I'm sure there's one out there, but I just can't think of a circumstance under which I do that. But funnily enough, the, this, <laughs> my campaign shares my campaign, my RPG campaigns share the same setting that this is set in but it's an area of the world that none of my players have ever gone to it's always been on kind of the outskirts there are events that are shared that kind of inspire and and help move the plot along but it's not it's not a yeah it's it it's not it's not characters that you're not going to see characters that have shown up in my campaigns appear here with one exception, if we ever get along to get around to the uh, the epilogue, which was actually quite a bit of fun, mm-hmm. and mostly it was mostly placed in there as an Easter egg for the players from that first campaign I had. Yeah, but yeah, original storyline definitely not because because I usually find it really boring when people start tell, telling me about their campaign. I I start I tune out. I don't know what it is. I get I I start getting a little bored, and I don't know I don't know why that is, but um. But I definitely didn't want to put that in a comic. I'm like it, it would have to be it would have to be really editorialized. But I did, I just had an original story that I wanted to tell, and that's that's where that came from. Mm-hmm. Now, when it now when it comes to do when it comes to doing fantasy, um. Given given the fact that you have char- that in the splash pages that I've seen you have characters with what amounts to gas masks in the in this thing, mm. would it be fair of me to say that you are n- that um somebody who's looking at the whole fantasy thing and expecting, for lack of a better term, Tolkien shit, is not going to entirely get that? It, well, if you're expecting Tolkien, you're definitely not going to get Tolkien. Uh, which is which is not to shame Mr. Tolkien or anything like that, but no, we're going to you're going to be encountering something that isn't quite Vance, I suppose. But we're looking at a I, I've described this elsewhere. It's more of a late nineteenth, early twentieth century world that has grown alongside magic that you're going to be encountering, and you're thinking more of like a a World War One era that this that this takes place in, rather than. Which has adjustments to include some of the more fat, 
classic fantasy elements like swords and bows and things of that sort, alongside slightly more recent technology, rather than rather than it's certainly not a medieval analog by any stretch of the imagination. Would it be fair to would it be fair of me to say that your approach to fantasy with Eyes of the Forest leans a little bit in the realm of diesel punk? Um, I stay away from diesel punk and steampunk and things of that sort because I just don't. It, it's very difficult for me to look at those genres and see unifying elements beyond aesthetic and because the aesthetic doesn't match what i have here like they're we're going for a pretty high fantasy vibe like this is a very magical world it's a very magical world and the events taking place that we're going to be following our characters through involve a lot of magic and they don't involve a ton of technology because of the region of the world it takes place in and and the context of the plot and stuff like that even though the broader setting has a lot of elements, say you could maybe say or steampunk or diesel punk, mm -hmm. and we might get glimpses of that, in particularly in flashbacks yeah. and and something that we have planned for issue two in particular. Although, when you mention world, when you mention World War One, and in term in terms of the technology level and the style of fantasy you're going for, I will admit that there's a small part of my brain that's that's going. This is your way of trying to sneak in airships, isn't it? I don't have to sneak in airships. Airships are all over the place in fantasy. The thing I have to sneak in is tanks. See, I'm a, I don't have to worry too much about <laughs> tanks with you because that's because that's not as much of a gimmick for you. Yeah, air, airships are my gimmick. I don't even feel like I'm sneaking it in at mm -hmm. this point. It's just it's just par for the course when it comes to me. If there's a if there's fantasy anything, there's going to be an airship in it. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm just w I'm just waiting to see how long it takes before you try and justify um, small airships so you can have so you can have um, dog fighting. I don't. Th I already did that. I already oh, did that oh, with the racket. That's uh, yeah. Because that was the original plan for Trails Through the Skies was the uh, the Pathfinder Second Edition supplement. Mm -hmm. Just putting. All right. Well, let's let's do fantasy biplanes at this point. Why not? Yeah. Well, it's best far enough. Why not? We we can do what we want. Now, you're collaborating with um, the duo known as Star Two for the for the art, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yes, I am. Was and I've seen I've seen you do I've seen you do various um, art pe art pieces on your website and on your feeds. Was it a case where you where you came to realize that you need that you're going to need somebody to handle the artistic part of things, and how how did you end up meeting up with them? Uh, so I, I definitely was not going to do the art for this on my own. Uh, I started from that. Uh, I, I I started from the position that I was going to outsource the art no matter what, because I am not that I am not that great of an artist to begin with. I am an amateur in many senses, and I'm still learning how to do different things and learning different styles and just learning how to render things that I want on the screen. Yeah, I, I'm still in those very beginning stages. I just have certain artistic tastes that I might be able to bring to bear, which is exactly what I did. Mm -hmm. So I looked around and I was looking at different artists. Actually, I think it was it was from an for an unrelated comics project where I was talking with my buddy Jake. Runs a YouTube channel called Your Selfie Got Leaked. Uh, we were going back and forth because we created a comic script that we were going to be working on. And we put the script out and we couldn't quite... We started talking with Start 2, I think... It, yeah, it was the recommendation of Sersova. Sersova Mag... Mm -hmm. The owner of Sersova Magazine. Mm -hmm. And he recommended us Start 2. And Start 2, they decided that they weren't going to be that great of a fit for the... Uh, for the hero comic that we were doing. But when it came to the fantasy comic that I later approached them about, I was like, hey, I, is this something that you're interested in? After looking at more of your art and looking at more of the style, I understand that they felt their style was not going to be appropriate for the superhero comic that we were doing. But as I went over it, I'm like, this would be perfect for a fantasy comic. And that's where the that's where the wheels really started turning when it came to when it came to Eyes of the Forest and rendering it as a comic came from. 
So that's where I, that's where I contacted them because I already knew from the beginning that I was going to be outsourcing the art. That wasn't that wasn't even a question. It was a matter of finding an artist and then finding the right artist, and that worked out perfectly as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. And now, when it comes to the skin, when it comes to the um, skinny of what you were writing when it come when it came to I when it came to Eyes of the Forest, um, because that because as I said, the initial pitch talks about duty betrayal and the whole get off my lawn kind of thing. So, wh if if you were to describe the skinny of what your um, plot would be would be about and what it would focus on, how would you describe that? I used to get asked about. I particularly interested folks wouldn't say, you know. <laughs> What's your book about? And so that's that's where I managed to develop the thirty second pitch. Because mm -hmm. you know, if you just ramble on like I'm doing here on Tinder, they they unmatch. But I have a captive audience. You, dear listener, are sorry you can't escape as easily. <laughs> I. <laughs> it's about it's it, the short of it is a war hero is accused of a crime that he didn't commit. And is as part of his peculiar punishment is sent to live in exile on the border, and he's charged with a specific position on the border that he is supposed to defend. The neighboring nation that he was formerly at war with comes to him and gives him an opportunity to betray his homeland for the for the sake of his own freedom and for the sake of his own revenge. He makes a choice, and he spends, he and everybody else around him spend the rest of the book paying for that choice. That's short of the plot. Mm -hmm. And I will admit that the whole, the whole line of get off, get off my lawn, get, um, prompts certain imagery in, in my head. And was that, in, was that intentional in terms of characterization? Oh, very much so. Very much. Runin is extremely Runin, which is taken from that is an Easter egg for the very first RPG character I had, who also happened to be a wood elf. I uh, very very grumpy person, very unhappy with his present set of circumstances because he was put there unjustly. He's you know he's being punished for a crime he didn't commit, mm -hmm. and uh, in spite of the in spite of the youth of the character, I very much lean into that. Very, very cynical, and has one particular has one shining mode of joy in his life, which would be his best friend, who is featured in the cover. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that I couldn't help but, but note, um, get, if, assume, given the um, given the artwork, given the artwork used, is the fact that the the fact that he you describe him as a wood elf, but if someone were to look at him, he definitely does not fit the um, assumed mold of what's of what someone would assume an elf to look like. Ah, uh, you're looking at the you're looking at the person in the center of the mm -hmm. cover. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's not Ronan. That is Alvis. That is the light of his life, and uh, that was a very specific. That was a very specific choice on the on the part of myself and Star Two. Is Alvis? I think is the POV character. I think he's a. I think he is the Rune in a sense is the character that the story centers on. But I mm -hmm. think Alvis is the person that is most relatable from the reader's perspective for a number of different reasons. One, it's just attitude. Mm -hmm. Two, Alvis is not a. Alvis has not. Alvis is sort of from this region of the world and has not ventured far outside of it. He is, he is the person with the less experience of the two. He's the person who is less cynical out of the two. He has an attitude you can relate to, and his knowledge of the world, which is very little, much more closely matches that of the reader, whose knowledge of the world only comes from the context clues that they are, and very brief explanations that they're gleaning from the text. Mm -hmm. You know? That's why, that's why we decided to have him be centered in the covers because we we really feel like he is the POV character. And given given that with ha with ha having having him having him as the POV character was 
was part of was the main reason for doing that to um have a character who the who the audience can act as a as a surrogate with so that the, so that they don't have as much um beforehand baggage for lack of a better term uh, a little bit yeah that's that sort of they, that wasn't really the point of that wasn't the point of including him to begin with if that sort of that just naturally evolved mm -hmm. it's like well one can one character out of these out of these four who are sort of central to the plot out of, one of these is going to be the most relatable and one of these is going to be the most naive and Alvis just kind of all along that quadrant. That's that's where Alvis fit. So he was the one who he was the one who filled that slot. Yeah. The other th the other thing I can't help but notice looking at looking at the art is when it comes to the kind of outfits that are that are shown, which are definitely not what one would expect from a high fa from a high fantasy approach, although. Even although, even though this is definitely on the pulp end of things, do you consider Eyes of the Forest to be high fantasy, or do you consider it to be more in the realm of low or even sword and sorcery approach? So I I have written posts about this about how I do not know what high fantasy means because I also do not know what high magic means because people keep using those two terms interchangeably. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is definitely not intrusion fantasy. This is not Earth, but ha it also has uh, this little bit of magic it, in it. That's that's not the case. This is its own world with its own history, which has grown alongside magic for a very long time since its inception, and has its development of technology and such has changed as a result, has differed from ours. And it includes... People who people who are not human, people who do not think like human, because their biology differentiates so so s severely from that of human biology. Their approach to life differs. How they grow up differs. Mm -hmm. In that sense, I suppose you could say if if that's what people mean by high fantasy, this is high fantasy. Yeah. But what what is what's especially striking to me is oh, is having. Have, having a clearly elven character with a with an outfit that isn't too far removed from what I'd expect to see in I guess I'd say, I guess for lack of a better term the old, the old west with a lot with all the with all the frills and the like Def, I mean there's definitely a mix of that and what someone would expect from fantasy but when when people think of the outfits that that they would see from an elf they are t they are typically think they're typically thinking of um of a lot a lot of le a lot of leaves a lot of um a lot of um, a lot of almost robe like outfits and that and that's clearly not what you're going for thank god because oh, absolutely not we yeah we mixed uh we mixed bomber jackets with native american themes mm -hmm. <laughs> and i'm pretty and while I'm pretty sure that some people are going to be are going to scream that we're, that you're somehow appropriating Native Americans, um, fuck them. No, I don't think anybody's going to do that. I I legitimately don't think anybody's going to do that. One because we've again we're mixing styles, mm -hmm. and or to to the extent that we're not mixing styles at this point, we are taking bits and taking inspirations to cultivate unique styles for each individual faction and each individual context that you're going to see these outfits in. So the, this, you know, the hunting jacket that Runin is wearing mm -hmm. as you scroll down and the fact that he has, you know, effectively shorts on and how that looks compared to what his armor might look like. Ditto for Alvis. Alvis has a little bit, has a very simple, basically not even like a peasant's dress, very simple, like cloth, sackcloth, whatever. Dressings. That differs pretty heavily from what his armor is going to look like. Yep. And if you, for whatever reason, saw them in a formal setting, that's going to differ strongly. And same for the uh, same for the breast rolls. You noted the you noted the particular 
examples of them. The particular Brestral soldiers that you can see here, they basically have gas masks on. Yeah. And that, you know, these these folks are part of effectively a spec op, so they're regiment of their own nation. And so their their particular style of dress is going to differ. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I don't think anybody nobody's going to raise a stink about it. And I I I just don't have time to pay attention to anybody who would. But I, I just don't point even and think. laugh. <laughs> yeah. But with that, now you've um you had described earlier your the setting for Eyes of the Forest as one where magic where magic is kind of has already has always been there, and it's just that technology is as gradually advanced along with it to a level akin to um, World War One era. Mm-hmm. That does make me ask one question, though. Um, even with even with that technological advancement, we're still we're still seeing. You mentioned swords are still a thing. You mentioned um, you mentioned bows are still a thing. Weapons that might be considered in other instances archaic. How are how would the how would those things be balanced out so it doesn't feel like a anachronism? Right. So there's a there's a few different methods of it. One is just the the simple prevalence of firearms is not there isn't a very great prevalence of firearms. Uh, firearms have a number of disadvantages in the in the sort of and, and these aren't really going to be gone into all that much, but mm-hmm. firearms have a how do I put this? Within the setting, gunpowder is a lot more volatile than it is in real life. And for, I guess for lack of a better term, it oxidizes faster. Mm-hmm. And the greater and greater quantities you store it in, and the longer you leave it there, the greater chance you have that something is going to go terribly wrong. And whatever eventually detonates in whatever storehouse you have stack- stockpiled this in is no longer going to resemble gunpowder, but something completely something even more volatile than it is inside this world. And so the the short of it is the people who use gunpowder in this setting tend to be one well funded, two well equipped, like they have the they have the money to purchase these items and maintain and they have the technical expertise to maintain these items and they also are put in positions where they use them very often Mm -hmm. and that that tends to be smaller numbers of units like very very small units or even just lone wolves who go out and they're adventuring or their treasure hunt you know the treasure hunter has a pistol that'll carry and he'll have a few rounds of ammunition and he'll resupply those few rounds of ammunition at each location he goes to. Or maybe he'll have the technical expertise to make it himself, but they don't, you know, they're not. Nobody's producing or stockpiling ammunition on Moss unless they are very quickly shipping it out to somewhere other than here. Mm-hmm. And, and probably shipping it carefully because the need to have that thing move quickly would probably be... Um... Ant would probably be a really, really juicy looking target for bandits. Of course. And so the the side the sort of technological side effects of that are one, when it comes to weapons that resemble modern weaponry, they tend to be based on steam more often than steam more often than uh than gunpowder. Mm-hmm. And that of course carries its own penalties because you're gonna have to oh, I have to lug around this heavy backpack. Uh, I have to lug around this boiler. I have to be tethered in some way to a larger boiler that's available. Or I have to carry around heavy canisters. I have a, I have a separate management of ammunition I have to worry about, which is how much air I actually have ex- how much pressurized air I have access to. So I'm, gu- I'm guessing when it comes to when it comes to ste- when it comes to steam-based firearms, they'd probably be a lo- they'd probably be more used in defensive emplacements. Uh, pneumatic weapons, yes. Yeah, more frequently. And and these are all just, you know, these are all just story concessions so that I have an excuse to have swords and bows and stuff like that. Yeah. I like to I like to say as I'm describing it, it's like, oh yeah, battles battles start with artillery shells and they end with swords and crossbows. So would in that regard would it be would the uh, tactics be more akin to pike and shot than anything else? No, no, they tend to be. It's gone to World War One style, where 
except with the exception of the invention of airships and how prevalent they are. Uh, there's a lot of trenching. There's a lot of like you know barricading oneself in and trying to make sure that you just have a lot a defensive line. And everybody behind you is in charge of making sure that nobody gets dropped from overhead to mm-hmm. get behind enemy lines. And that's that's where the competition goes. So it, it doesn't resemble... That's that's what I meant earlier when I said, like, this is a world where technology has grown up alongside magic. Is like, this this doesn't resemble historical military tactics. I mean, you're probably... You're more likely to find something in a game of planet side that resembles military tactics in this setting than you are in anywhere in history. Well, I would except I would except for the except for the fact that um every, except every time I try and dig up dig up my um account for plan, for Planet Side 2, I keep getting reminded of all the camouflage bullshit. <laughs> yeah, I don't think anybody. Yeah, I don't think anybody particularly likes Planet Side 2 nowadays, especially not the people playing Planet Side. But you get the idea where like Air, people airdrop or they'll they'll sneak sunders behind line behind enemy lines and then you have the drop pod system where people are people are dropping from the sky it, it much more resembles that than than anything you're going to find in military history oh, yeah and that that itself is extremely uh that that itself is not particularly close to begin with and when Given that I did want to, I did want to ask a bit on the pre, on the presence of magic in this setting. Now, given given your given your stance and my stance on the on some of the more traditional attitudes with magic, you know the whole I need to take an eight hour rest so I can re, so I can remember the spells, even though I have this fucking book in front of me that has all my spells, kind kind of thing. Um. What is what is the approach when it comes to magic? Is it is it something that's inherent to people? Is it a studied practice? Is it is it a case where you can cast until you get tired? What are the rules that you have for the magic system in Eyes of the Forest? Well, I think uh, you you may have mischaracterized me a little bit. Is <laughs> I I love fancy magic. I absolutely adore fancy magic. I just I just view that the I, I just look at the concessions because people nowadays they do not know fancy and magic for fancy they know it for Dungeons and Dragons mm-hmm. and they look at the sort of gameplay concessions made to Vance re- to incorporate fancy and magic rather than fancy and magic to begin with. I well, think the, Vance- well, the funny thing, the the even funnier thing is is um, some of the systems that were in Vance's book were specifically. Him giving a middle finger to some of the um, gameplay concessions. Yeah, I think he went back and joked at some point that his magic system was uh, point based or whatever. Mm-hmm. But we're not we're not really getting into the uh, at least in the comic we're not particularly mm-hmm. getting into the magic system. But 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 I I like fancy magic. I assume in my setting, I I guess I assume fancy and magic. It's just that fancy and magic carries heavier and heavier heavier penalties the more that you deviate from it, and or higher and higher costs the more you deviate from it. So Runin, for instance, is not he doesn't really have to worry about fancy and magic. He just consumes the essence of of plant life around him. In order, because he is bonded to this area of the land, so it is his unique privilege when within this within the company of this land that he gets to take energy from it and output it into uh, output it into magic. Mm-hmm. And it's mostly and the more the more he has at his disposal, the more he gets to use of it. And once he runs out of that, then he has to resort to more standard. I guess I almost said mundane, and that would be silly. In a, would be a silly word to use in a conversation about magic. But the more he has to rely on standard methods of preparing magic, and the same goes for Alvis, and the same goes for Marcus, who will eventually appear in the comic. Mm-hmm. And given when it comes to the whole, when it comes to the whole penalties thing, um, is it a, is it a case of? Of pen- of dealing with fatigue, or would or the penalties be a bit more dire? Uh, basically, the the magic could potentially misfire. 
and then you end up exploding or worse. Oh yeah, it will. It's, you know, it's you know causes you physical pain. Maybe it causes some kind of injury that you have to deal with later. <laughs> you're not going to see a lot of that in the comic. I can tell you that now. It's because it, you're we're going to be going along with people who are who are pretty competent at this stuff, going toe to toe. So yeah. they, it's you're going to be you're going to see less of them making mistakes and far more of them trying to outdo each other. Uh, that that definitely makes sense. Although when you say outdo each other, I I end up having this vi this visualization of an almost an almost Abbott and Costello like relationship between the two main characters. I can't. I can't, I'm sorry. I can't parse that into a response. I I don't know how to. Uh, I don't. I don't know if that necessarily matches. <laughs> But I under but I understand where you're going. Mm -hmm. No, when I said outdo each other, I meant like people who were people who were opponents mm -hmm. trying to outdo each other. Outdo each other. Yeah, that that makes sense. It's just I had to. Um, I'm legally required to make at least one bad joke a show. No, that's I mean, and I would I would I would not dream of stopping you at any point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now. Given the um, given the more covert soldiers that are in some, are in some of the art, I was a bit curious about the whole blue flame that we see in one of the images. Mm hmm. Um. Is that is that a case of a t of a type of magic that's unique to that um u unique to that unit, or is it or is it a case of their own version of like fairy fire or something? Well, look look closely at the uh, Zuby if. If you're not already, definitely zoom in on that page. Mm -hmm. and go ahead and look at it. Yeah. Uh, what's that first panel doing? Um, the first pa the first panel he's holding up t he's holding up two fingers while a blue glow is just under the um, mouth part of his mask. Alrighty. And yeah. the next panel we see mm -hmm. the next panel. What what do we see here? We see we see it we see it appear to come out of the mask like he's breathing out. All right, and in the next three panels, you can see folks who appear to be, uh, or will cer certainly will once folks actually read this, mm -hmm. uh, separate members of this unit, and they're all holding up. They're all holding hands up to their ears as the flame either emanates or pours into them. Mm -hmm. So, what, given those context clues, what would you think this is? I would I would guess a me a method of communication or sh or sharing information between multiple operatives. And you would be correct. And this is, this is something that I don't know if this will make another appearance in there, but this is just kind of our. This is how Star Two and I approach approach portraying magic. In the system is is we use visual cues and we we use context clues basically mm -hmm. a a grease spell is the you know somebody's pointing at the ground and they are making a they're making the ASL sign for for grease and for us uh, or slipperiness I think it was under a character's feet and then the grease appears and there's there's all these visual cues to follow along with basically. Mm -hmm. And no, no, it's not. It's not. Uh, it's not unique to this particular unit. Other, it's you know, it's like just messaging other people with magic, uh, if they have that sort of thing available to themselves. Mm -hmm. And given the given that given the um the approach the approach that you have that you have with um the, with this particular with this particular unit um. Some something I'm something I'm curious about, especially given the relationship between um, magic and technology, with it within the setting, it and the fact that magic is a bit is a bit fancy in the way you describe it, is whether is whether or not the that sort of intersection between the two has applied towards people's equipment. Uh, you will probably not see a gun that shoots fireballs, but you might see an enchanted gun. 
In fact, you will see at some point you'll see an enchanted gun. I can I can actually affirm that now. So an, it would basically just be a gun that's just a little bit more reliable and a little bit harder to break because of a misfire. Uh that's not my approach to magic. You should know. You should know me by now. <laughs> this is not the plus zero. It, listen, if you want to talk about plus zero magical guns, there's uh, somebody else you could talk to. Uh, they are not. They are not present in my temple. But I need to be No, I. I didn't mean. I didn't mean it in some sort of press. In some sort of plus zero. But that the idea of an of an enchant of enchanting it is that it's able to do a, do be, able to do um what it was intended to do just slightly be, just slightly better. All right. No, no. Now. Now I have a better understanding of your question. Mm -hmm. uh, no, it is. It produces magical effects. A, a firearm that is, for instance, enchanted by these people mm -hmm. that you see in the panel here, uh, the, or sorry, enchanted by, for instance, elves, and they don't tend to use firearms, but these ones in particular, it's like, no, the, the bullet hits and outwards comes a hail of thorns effect, mm -hmm. for instance, or vines come out of it and... and grapple the, and wrap around whatever whatever creature the bullet happened to smack. Yeah. It, that's the sort of magic that that would apply in this instance. Which I can I can definitely uh, get that. Now when it now um when it when it comes to the creative process between you, between you and um star, and star 2 is it a case where there's a lot of a lot of back and forth bet between you two, where you you might suggest an idea you might suggest an idea for how for a given scene, a given panel, or what have you, and and um then kind of refine it from there with a lot of back and forth slash arguing. Uh so I will, I w so how do I put this? The process is I I put to get through the script. Mm-hmm. And I send it to Star 2 and they read it over and stuff like that. And then they start working on it. And, and largely they are faithful to the script. But at any point when we start going over the script, is we'll come up with ideas. I will come up with ideas later. They will come up with ideas later. And we'll basically have a back and forth on them. Yeah. Like the, uh, let's see here, the, pe the page under how you can help features Runin in a... Um, you know he's holding a bow forward, and he's got two arrows in his in his left hand. Mm -hmm. And that's that's that is a stance that is a pose that actually got a quite a few revisions to it because there was one in which he had the thing still drawn, which was a simple oversight. Uh, and then we tried putting the I think we discussed putting the arrows in the hand that was holding the bow as well, so that they were kind of crossing his body. Mm -hmm. And that's something that that's more of an art that's more faithful to an archer's typical stance. But then we went back. Star two proposed like they're like, hey, if we just keep the arrows back here, it'll hence the you know it'll be a better silhouette and it'll look nicer from this perspective. I was like, ah, oh, that's that's a pretty good idea. And for instance, the Alvis coming out of the trees. I was like, well, what if we had basically like a particle effect of of these glowing green leaves around him and stuff like that to better indicate that this was magic and they're like oh good idea in fact we're gonna put an outline on the you know he's stepping out of this tree we're gonna put like a portal like outline on it mm -hmm. and it's a con a rather constant back and forth well we'll go they prefer me to propose something first uh which i can definitely which i can definitely respect even though sometimes i'm i'm as sometimes i'm at a loss for ideas and i'm like what do you think that we should do? And they're like, why don't you come up with something first and then we'll spitball it back and forth. I'm like, mm -hmm. good, good idea. Good idea. That's probably for the best. Um, so no, there's, mm -hmm. and there's been like no arguing over anything. Uh, it's, we have very similar visions for how this process go. I very much look at them as like, co I, I am not bossing them around. They, I, I treat them like coworkers or, or folks I am working on a project with. This is very mm -hmm. much, it's a collaborative process, and they're they're very good at it. They're very good at it. Anytime we start going bouncing ideas back and forth, it's so much fun. Yeah, and earlier on, you met, you mentioned how you how um when writing the initial scripts, you kind of had a humbling experience when it came to 
what you could and could and couldn't write. Which leads me to ask one, about one particular aspect of of writing that I often see some people um some people struggle with, some people struggle less with, but is one of those e one of those things that's a very easy pit to fall into, and that is writing fight scenes. Mm. Um, was that something that was relatively easy for you, or was it something that you ha that you had a lot of trouble with? I don't know about easy, and I don't know about trouble. I was very much... It was just something that I took extra time on when it was an actual fight. When, like, mm -hmm. when people were going back and forth as opposed to just one party being ambushed by the next. Whenever I put the focus on the combat as a back and forth, I just paid additional detail to it. I'm like, alright, these people are in this position... I want to make sure that I don't have too much of an exhausting back and forth. Like, a, look, what was it? One of the Hobbit movies. Actually, in a lot of the Hobbit movies, there was like a reversal every three seconds, as opposed to, in you know, Indiana Jones is fighting this one guy and he's getting beat. You know, he beats the guy up for a little bit, and then the guy gets the upper hand, and he's beating Indiana Jones up, and then the he Indiana Jones pushes him into, uh propeller spinning propeller blades and he gets juiced and indiana jones has won the fight i was keeping it i was keeping an eye on that so i wouldn't say it was it was hard for me necessarily i was just paying special additional detail to it i, I made sure that if i had any checkoff guns they were all fired because mm -hmm. there were there were a few instances and it's like oh uh these people are present in the combat let me make sure that the camera at the very uh, let me make sure that they're in the shot at the very least i can i can certainly get that um when you were when you were developing scenes what were you going through a whole lot of research material to kind of help you visualize how you'd want combat to go or did it just come naturally oh not there i definitely didn't research it it was <laughs> just like i have i have specific scenes that i would like to see play out mm-hmm and I'm going to make sure that that happens. I make sure that everybody is in there. I'm going to make sure that everybody takes their places. And then, you know, I'm not really concerned with fidelity to like, oh, this is how this unit would bunch up. It's like, no, 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 that, that doesn't. We've already, I've already established that, that that doesn't work in this setting to begin with. So I, I felt, definitely felt free to have people take positions and and sort of set themselves up for the scenes that I wanted to see mm -hmm. in a way that felt plausible to myself and anybody reading rather than rather I I wasn't worried about fidelity to any kind of real world examples at all mm -hmm. and that that was a big help frankly yeah. and oh now a lot of times I've um I've seen I've seen various works um, especially, especially when it comes to works that are trying to establish some sort of setting, we'll typically write out some sort of um, series bible. Um, mm. You see this a lot in tel you see this a lot in long running serialized television, especially. Um, and it'll usually contain ca characters, important story beats, things to basically create, basically make sure that everything stays relatively consistent. Did you end up when? Did you end up writing? something like that before you started writing the script when it came to eyes of the forest or was it or was it something that happened in reverse uh a little bit of both except i didn't, definitely didn't write anything down because as i've established i find writing incredibly tedious i just knew details about the i i knew details about the setting and they informed my they informed the shape that my writing took and then there were smaller, more specific details that came out of the writing because they needed to be present for certain things to either work or be particularly entertaining in the fashion I wanted them to be. And for what it's worth, I'm using writing as a shorthand in this case. It could have been bullet points. It could have been index cards. It, for all for all I know, it could have been post-it notes. Like, all right, I, no, I, well, I I took writing in the literal sense of, mm -hmm. or really just any like putting words to anything. In which case, it was no. <laughs> I think I wrote out about uh, three... I wrote out very few notes 
about anything concerning the book and they were mostly just the direction of the plot making sure like okay what was the reminding myself what was the purpose of mentioning xyz mm -hmm. and it was like oh yeah the, the the purpose of mentioning this is just to say that no help will be coming to this area when these people attack mm -hmm. because they're expecting this friendly thing instead of this hostile invasion force or whatever yeah oh Sounds like sounds like somebody was expecting the welcome wagon, and they got the welcome to hell wagon. Right. Well, somebody said that a welcome wagon was coming, and in, instead they wanted the welcome to hell wagon to come, mm -hmm. which was a particular that which was a particular bit of fun. It's like wait, wait a minute, because because that's something I never went into, even across the book of Vice of the Forces. Wait. Why Why do these people want this clearly hostile nation? Why do they want them to waltz into the capital? It's like, well, don't know, but they're, but they're doing it, and we're following along the guy who's trying to decide whether or not stopping them is worth it. Because mm -hmm. no. clearly these people wanted it, and they were willing to screw him over to get it. Ah, politics. Gotta love it. Absolutely. Especially Roman politics. And by the time I finish this sentence, another Roman emperor, emperor has been assassinated. Yep, shame. Made it to 12 at least. Um, <laughs> well, haven't you ever heard of the Roman handshake? I have not heard of the Roman you handshake. Shake, you shake with the left hand, you stab with the right. I see, I see. Um, I've also heard it referred to as the Tennessee handshake. Don't know why. I also don't know why, if anybody was wondering. I have not been to Tennessee. <laughs> Well, neither, neither have I. Maybe but... somebody from Tennessee can can inform us in the comments. Mm -hmm. Maybe they can help us out. But the the appro the um, but you're in, now, if I'm not mistaken, you're aiming for this issue one to be about twenty four pages. Is that is that correct? It, it's twenty two pages 22 for the first issue. And when it com when it comes to the when it comes to those um those pa that particular set that particular setup were there were there any sort of were there any sort of guidelines that you had that you had in mind in terms of framing the individual panels or did you leave that up to um, star two? So I set I set out the actual panels because I I. Like that's important for the the people writing the script mm -hmm. should do that. They should say this is in the top right, this is in the top left, this is in the center, et cetera, et cetera. And I had a little bit of experience from that from the aforementioned previous comic project that I've been working on with my buddy Jake, where we he had bought some comic that actually went into the the process. Like it had the the script in the back of it as like this neat little bonus for anybody who was reading. It's like, mm -hmm. here's the actual script that was written out and, and given to the artists and the letterist. Um, and they, and from reading that and basing our superhero comic off of that, as well as just starting to read other comics that he said, like, these are the, these are the ones that have a style that I appreciate and, and a look to them that I would like to emulate. Mm hmm. We then I t I took all the knowledge that I gained from that particular project and I, I applied it there. But I will say that when I asked Star Two about it, because I wasn't particularly sure, I think we had a conversation about that at the beginning, and they sent a basically guidelines to like, well, these are the things that typically happen in comics, and that you might like in particular. Like this is this is kind of the flow. Like most of these are going to have probably have three or four panels uh, to a on a given page and that's going to produce this particular visual effect and they had some very helpful guide they had very helpful guidelines on their own before i actually finished the script and put it together actually it might have been that i finished the the writing of the script i think i messaged them about not being sure what to what to do about like talking Wh i think i asked them a question but like how do you want me to write out uh panel position because i'm actually i'm not sure what these panels are going to look like on a given page and i'm thinking of doing three to four and they're like well if you're planning to do three to three to four this is how it's probably going to turn out and they wrote 
their response, this goes back to that back and forth uh, development process, that collaborative process that I mentioned earlier, where they were just such a huge help. And they, you know, they said, this is how it's going to turn out, probably. And I said, that's exactly what I want. So I went back to the script. I sort of put it, I put in all the panel positions. Mm-hmm. Now, when it comes, now, when it comes to, you've, um, now, for, the next thing I wanted to ask is, now, I've, I've had you on a few times with previous crowdfunds that you've done, and most of the time they've been on Kickstarter. Mm. What prompted you to go with Indiegogo this time around? Uh, that was on the recommendation of other people that I tried to kind of get in. I, I guess I kind of tried to... I, I don't know how to enter clicks. Mm-hmm. I don't know how to enter communities of of people who are movers and shakers. I know how to enter communities as a commentator, I guess. But not as... I don't know how to get into the inner circle. Mm-hmm. If that makes sense. Um, Ethan Van Skyver lives five, ten minutes away from me, for Christ's sake. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't... I, I I don't know how to... But I, I was talking with some of the people. Like, I'm in, I'm in one particular group chat. Which which was very helpful and a, a lovely woman who runs a um, runs a YouTube channel called Red Valkyrie. Mm-hmm. Basically, sat down with me for an hour and went through. It's like these are the things that these are the things that are going to happen if you boot up on Indiegogo. These are the features of Indiegogo they might be more familiar with because she didn't know that I was familiar with. She didn't know that I had a history of crowdfunding stuff on tabletop, and we went back and forth mm-hmm. on that. And how I was crowdfunding on on Kickstarter primarily, and she's like, "Well, there's a bit of a split in in the comics community." And she walked me through that, and it's like, "Yeah, most more people are going to there's going to be, there's a trend towards." And at the time, I believe this was the case. There was a trend towards just backing things on Indiegogo, uh, mm-hmm. if you were part of the comics community and and spreading the word. If some if a project was coming out on Indiegogo, you spread the word. If there was a project coming out on Kickstarter. There was a bit of a tendency to poo-poo it, uh, mostly because mostly because Kickstarter was not treating certain artists appropriately. Frankly, just shutting a lot of things down without warning, and and it wasn't clear why at the time, at the very least. Mm-hmm. Now I don't think that that that's as much the case. I think it's calmed down a lot. I think that the craze over a lot of indie comics, and so far as like find every new person you can, that's definitely calmed down a lot because I am not on that list. Yeah, I am not on that list. And you could see that. I, I, I have no trouble mentioning this. I only have 82 bucks. I've been up for uh, eight days. I only have 82. And that number has stayed constant for the past like three days. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that would not be the case if I had started on Kickstarter, which is why if this particular one falls through, that's totally fine because one, Indiegogo has flexible funding. Uh, that's another reason I chose Indiegogo first is, is at first they, they used to have more features than Kickstarter did. As I discussed in my last crowdfund, a lot of those features have actually made their way over to Kickstarter. So, and Kickstarter, obviously I have the bigger audience. Mm first i was going to give people who act on indiegogo i was going to give them the first shot at this Mm -hmm. and uh if that didn't if that wasn't the case you know if they if they didn't take the take a bite that's totally fine i can just go on to kickstarter later but there's a comics i would not be interested in this probably if there was not an indiegogo comics community so i'm going to go over to indiegogo first i'm going to give them the first swipe at it because i feel like that's that's a responsible thing to do all right, that definitely makes sense. Um, and even if even if um, the Indiegogo thing do- doesn't pan doesn't end up panning out, I get the distinct feeling that this that this particular endeavor is going to is going to make its way to a reality. It's just a matter of how it does how it does it and how it goes about it. Oh yeah, no Kickstarter is going to make bank for sure. Mm-hmm. I just I, like I said, I don't know how to get into the into the uh, the in crowd. I don't know how to get into the in community, but that's fine because I'm just gonna pump. I'm just gonna pump more money into it next time around. Yeah, and because uh, because I 
do not know how to make content. Like, I already had enough trouble with it. I don't know what the RPG in crowd is, even. I don't even know who is it. I, I see freelancer names come up when it comes to, like, new Wizards of the Coast projects and stuff like that. I'm like, I have no idea who any of these people are. Lots of people do. I have no idea. They, they've they never come across my Twitter feed before, even. And mm. I have just no idea how to enter that, that space. And it's the same with comics. But a, a comic seems to be a little bit more welcoming. So we're gonna see we're gonna see what happens there. I'm gonna try to contact people and just say, hey, I I want to know how to make it in this industry. Do you, and, and I need your help. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna kiss I'm gonna kiss the ring, Caesar. Ethan, Ethan, if, if you're listening, if you're listening, one, let's go, Ethan, Ethan Van Sky, if you are listening, one, let's go get the uh, let's go get wings of the pickle lily because I think they're <laughs> open again. But uh, my treat, and but two, I I need to know how to how to make it in comics and i'm a willing student to all mm-hmm. <laughs> well, I ho- um i hope i hope that by some miracle i can get i can get him to pay to pay attention on th- on this front and we'll, and we'll just mm-hmm. we'll just clip it and send it to him fuck it <laughs> yeah i guess i guess that i guess that can be do- that can be done um and it's not like this is my first rodeo with bringing somebody on who's wor- who's working on a, in- a indie comic. So I'll I'll see I'll see what I can do on my on my end to help out because hey it it hey, um I al- I always pay this shit forward. Absolutely, you know I appreciate it, brother. Mm-hmm. But I'll de- either way I'll definitely be looking forward to to how Eyes of the Forest um develops. And the and the and the fact that we we definitely we definitely need a a um fa- a the idea of a fantasy version of Clint Eastwood is something that I am perfectly fine with. <laughs> oh, absolutely. And hey, it's and hey, I can use this as a counter argument to to show. See, I don't hate all elves. I just hate I just hate most of them. Right. <laughs> well, you might hate the. Who knows? By the by the end of the story, you might not like the elf. That's up to you. Um. Well, there there are. <laughs> layers. You'll be able to tell them that you gave it a shot at least. I gu- I guess there you are layers say, I, to my I, hatred. I, I put my arm out. I put the <laughs> olive branch out, and the elf smacked it away. So clearly, it's their fault. Yeah, you put you put out an olive branch to the elves, and they and they and they are insulted that you use the wrong color branch. You get you extend a knowledge branch to the dwarves, and they'll they'll still insult you. But afterwards, you can get drunk. Yeah, no, that's fair enough. But with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule and being willing to come to come back up to the temple. Of course, of course, anytime. Mm-hmm. And obviously, anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Absolutely. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, Stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>